Welcome to Bridging Borders, the podcast where we try to bridge the gap between cultures through insightful conversations. Together, we explore diverse topics from productivity to language learning, all the while helping you improve your English skills. Hey, Sam, how's it going? Hey, Veronica, I'm really good. Uh, It's Wednesday today and tomorrow is my last day of work for the week because I'm going to London on the weekend. So... I'm pretty excited for that. I've only been to London three times in my life, even though I live in England and one of them was only for a few hours to watch a football match. So I'm pretty excited to go. and I'm going to see one of my good friends from university that I haven't seen in a while. How are you doing? Nice. Yeah, I'm very, very excited for you too. Well, I have never been to London before, but obviously I would like to go one day. Uh, yeah, I'm doing great. Um, I had a workout class this morning, so I'm feeling quite sore. But at the same time, I'm very excited to talk about habits today. Um, that's the topic we're going to be discussing today. We're going to talk about what is a habit and what habits do we have, me and Sam. Also, we're going to talk about automated habits versus purposeful habits and a lot of other things connected to building good habits. So I'm very excited. So what does the word habit mean for you? I think for me, the word habit is very interesting because when I think about a habit or when I think about all the habits that I personally have, it's definitely something that I do automatically. It's not something that requires a lot of decision-making, but maybe in the past, yes, I had to you know, force myself a little bit to start doing that. A good example is studying Spanish. Because right now, I study Spanish almost automatically every single evening. Like for me, it's my routine. It's my habit. Like if, for example, somebody invites me out to go somewhere in the evening, I feel like I'm skipping my Spanish class and it's a little weird. I'm like, oh my God, I have to study Spanish right now. It's like 6 p.m. You know, it's time for me to study Spanish. So yeah, it's definitely something that I do automatically, something that doesn't require a lot of thought or decision making. What about you? Yeah, that's quite similar to me. I'd say some things I need to motivate myself for. So for example, if I was to start learning Spanish again, because it's not in my repertoire of things that I do on a daily basis, I would have to maybe choose a time and a place where I'd study Spanish and maybe choose how often I want to do that, for example, every day or every Monday or every Wednesday. So I would need to motivate myself for that. But some things I don't need to motivate myself for, like um, making my bed, for example, or taking a shower or brushing a teeth, brushing my teeth, sorry. And... Recently, I have been going to the gym quite consistently for the last two years, I'd say. And it's become a habit for me where I don't really need to motivate myself to go. Only very occasionally, there'll be a day when maybe I feel like I'm getting a little bit sick or I'm feeling a bit sore or tired. And then I'll really have to motivate myself. And maybe I'll watch a, a YouTube video or listen to some music to try and pump me up to go to the gym. But for me, it's a almost an automated habit. And that's because I've been going at the, the same time. So for the last maybe six months, I've been doing it as soon as I wake up. So I either run or go to the gym most days. So I wake up, I drink some water, I go to the bathroom and, you know, I move around a little bit and I think, okay, it's time to do some exercise. But mm-hmm. I guess some of them are like really automated, like getting out of bed in the morning. I don't have to even think about doing this. Like I wake up, I'm in my bed and I just leave. Like that is a different habit than going to the gym because I still have to consciously think and go through the motions of going to the gym. So I have to think, okay, where's my bag? Am I going to go in the sauna today? Uh, You know, look at the times, what time do I need to be back? But with some habits like brushing my teeth or getting out of bed, they they just kind of happen more naturally, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, one of the things that might contribute to it is because, for example, you've been making your bed your whole life, let's say. I don't know, but I, I can <laughs> I can only talk about myself, right? I remember when I was a kid, I would always make my bed. And uh, that's why right now it just feels like second nature. It feels so natural for me to get out of bed and make my bed because 
I can't imagine just looking over and seeing my bed like a whole mess, right? So that's a little bit weird for me. And I think that's also why a lot of athletes, like professional athletes or people who exercise a lot experience the same thing. Because I remember as a kid, I I did gymnastics for a very long time. And then when I quit, it was so weird for me that I didn't have to go to, you know, the gym and train and, uh, you know, do all of those gymnastics things. And I would just sit at home and feel like, oh my God, like I need to go right now. Like right now is my workout, but I didn't, I didn't have to obviously because I quit. So that's also because it basically becomes your second nature. As you said, like, it's just so automated. And that's why for me right now, going to the gym is not very automated because I had a huge break. Like, and I feel bored sometimes when I have to go to the gym. And that's why, like, I really have to make myself do it. And I wanted to ask you this question because you just told me that you you okay. have this habit of going to the gym. So what helped you build this habit? Or and like what can what do you think can help other people build a new habit? It's a good question. I guess with the gym. It's one of those things that if you don't really try to do it consistently, you see the the negatives of not doing it consistently, if that makes sense. So if I go to the gym four times a week for three months and I can see the results in, in the mirror, I can look at myself. I think, OK, you, you know, you you look better than you did three months ago. But if I don't go for two weeks then I'll look at myself in the mirror and like my body will look smaller. My like back will, I'll have like more pains in my body. So for me, I feel like I've committed to going to the gym. It's like a decision I've made. I've, I think, okay, I want to be a person who goes to the gym. I want to have uh, an aesthetic body. I want to feel good within myself. So I know that if I'm not consistent with it, then it's kind of pointless because even though I go to the gym consistently now, I there was a time where, but well, I've been I've been going to the gym since I was really sixteen, uh, maybe six, maybe seventeen, eighteen, but I never really took it too seriously. I maybe met, went twice a week or like three times a week for like three months, and then I'd stop, and then I'd start, and things would get in the way, and uh, or maybe they were just excuses. But I never really took it that seriously. And I, this this year, I said to my friend, I said, if I'm not in good shape by summer. I'm just going to stop going to the gym altogether. So that's the reason why I have consistently gone because it's something that I see value in in myself. When I know the feeling of not going to the gym and the feeling of going to the gym and it feels a lot better when I'm going consistently. And I guess once you've been enough times, I kind of identify myself as a person who goes to the gym. I identify as a weightlifter. If someone said, do you lift weights? I would say yes. And I think this is really important. I think I read in a book, I think it's Atomic Habits by James Clear, the importance of identity when it comes to habits. So if we look at people who uh, smoke cigarettes and they want to stop smoking cigarettes, if someone who smokes says, no, I'm quitting, you, you know, I don't want a cigarette, I'm, I'm quitting. When they're saying I'm quitting, they're still identifying as someone who smokes, but they're trying not to smoke. Someone who says, sorry, I'm a non-smoker, I don't smoke. They have identified as someone who doesn't smoke. So it's the identity is a really important part for forming habits and breaking habits. And in terms of the gym, I think also in that book, which is a really good book on habits, they mentioned someone who wanted to form the habit of going to the gym and identifying as someone, I think it was to do about identity, about identifying as someone who goes to the gym. And they looked at this person who just had the goal of going to the gym every day. It, they didn't need to do a workout, but they just went through the motions of driving or cycling or walking to the gym, walking into the building. And if they wanted to, they could just turn around straight away because they've done the goal of actually going to the gym. The goal wasn't to work out. The goal was to go to the gym and they did. And over time, after those repetitions of doing that, they identified as someone who went to the gym and I guess that habit stuck. So for me, if I was to try and advise someone to go to the gym, maybe it depends on the person. I 
I like training alone. Some people like training with other people. I think that's a really good idea. If you have like an accountability buddy, you can go with them. And if you don't want to go, they can text you saying, come on, let's go. And you, you do have to go. So there's a few ways to do it. I guess it's about being creative and trying to enjoy it. I actually enjoy the gym, which helps. I think the first couple of weeks or months or sessions really do suck. It's like running. If you, if you don't run and you run just for the first time, you think, wow, that was horrible. I don't want to do that again. But the more times you do it, you think, okay, that wasn't too bad. And then you start to actually enjoy it. So it's about maybe embracing the fact that it's going to suck for the first few weeks or months. And then after you see results and, and after you start identifying with it and you're proud of yourself, then it becomes a lot easier. Yes, absolutely. Like what you said really resonated with me because this idea of identity, like having a strong identity when it comes to building a new habit is very important because unfortunately, I don't remember the author of this quote, but the quote is, act like the person you want to become. And that's absolutely true when you want to build a new habit. As you said, you want to be able to tell people I'm a weightlifter because I go to the gym. Like you used a very good example with quitting, for example, smoking. And uh, that's something that I struggle with when I decided to learn Spanish. Well, I kind of had to learn Spanish because I moved to Mexico. And so the first four to five months, I was trying to learn Spanish. That was my identity. <laughs> I would always tell people, I'm trying, I'm trying to learn Spanish. And because of that, I wasn't actually learning. Like I was not acting like the person I wanted to become. And I wanted to become a fluent Spanish speaker. And then probably I would say eight months in like yeah it took me eight months to actually realize that I was doing something wrong and so eight months in I was like actually I need to stop trying and start learning <laughs> you know sometimes you just have to stop trying and start doing it actually and be confident in what you're doing and uh, when you talk to people tell them yes I'm learning Spanish Maybe right now my Spanish, you know, I'm not like 100% fluent, but it's fine. But I'm still learning. I'm not trying. I'm learning. I'm very serious about it right now. And I think one more thing that really helps me when it comes to building a new habit is what I called habit stacking. I think it's something that I talk about a lot on YouTube because this really helps me because I... I mean, I don't want to call myself a lazy person, but like if I don't have to do something, I'm not going to do it. And that's why it's hard for me to go to the gym right now. And uh, habit stacking really helps me. So basically this idea is um, you try to associate your new habit with your existing routine or habit, like something that you already do. For example, you mentioned every single morning you get out of bed, you make your bed and you brush your teeth, etc. So usually... Obviously, I do all of those things too. And at the same time, I listen to a podcast in Spanish. So I try to habit stack. I know that I'm going to brush my teeth. I'm going to make breakfast. And at the same time, I'm listening to something in English or in Spanish because obviously I want to practice these languages. Well, especially something in Spanish. Um, yeah, another example could be if you want to start meditating daily. You can do it right after your existing habit. For example, you can tell yourself, okay, I have breakfast and right after I have breakfast every single day, I'm going to meditate. So that works too. It's kind of like one habit and then you're doing your next habit. Yeah. Yeah. I've used that in the gym before when it comes to stretching because stretching was something that I really wanted to start doing and uh, forming. I wanted to form the habit of stretching daily. But I'd always, I'd have like a goal to stretch daily, but I wouldn't have like a specific time or place that I'd do it. And it'd get later in the day, it'd get later in the day. And then it's like 30 minutes before bed. And I'm like, oh, I'm quite tired now. And some days I would just skip it and wouldn't, and wouldn't do it. So I found that the, the best way for me to start stretching was to do it as soon as I finished my workout. So I'd allow for 10 to 15 minutes after my workout and then while I'm in the gym, I would just get a stretching mat and do it there. So I guess that's an example of habit stacking uh, that I've used and been successful with. But yeah, it's a great idea to 
um, create new habits. Yes, absolutely. That's a good example. Yeah, that's exactly an example of habit stacking. Yeah. And I also, I feel like I have to add this very important fact that um, in life, at least this is what I believe in, like we're always improving, like step by step. And sometimes, you know, people tell me, oh, like my language skills are not improving. But if you're working towards improving your language skills, then you are improving. Sometimes we just don't see the progress. And um, recently I learned about this uh, Japanese philosophy called Kaizen. It's very, very interesting. If you guys are interested in uh, like habits, creating good habits, you really have to learn more about Kaizen. So Kaizen is a Japanese term and it means change for the better or continuous improvement. And this part, continuous improvement, is the most important thing about Kaizen. Basically, it's this philosophy of uh, how we're always improving. And instead of focusing on this big goal of like, I want to become a very successful weightlifter or like go to the gym like every single day and be super super successful we should really focus on small improvements for example as you mentioned yes i'm gonna go to the gym today i did it i'm gonna stretch after my workout i did it so the small incremental improvements are very important and that's exactly how we change over time because i think the reason why a lot of people don't have this philosophy of Kaizen, it's probably because of the school system. Because when we are in school, we have to cram for exams. A lot of people do. And cramming is not small, continuous improvements. It's like sitting down the night before your exam and you're like, no, I have to like memorize everything, all this information because I want to get a good grade. But in reality, if you actually want to be good at this subject, if it's something that you like, you know, you want to dedicate your life to learning more about this. For example, let's say, in my example, it's going to be YouTube, right? I can't just like sit for five hours and uh, be the YouTube, become like this YouTube genius. It doesn't work this way. It's like every single day you're making the small incremental improvements and that's how you improve over time. Yeah, it's it sounds a little bit similar to focusing on systems rather than goals. And so, for example, if someone wanted to become a C1 level speaker in English, for example, they might have that as their overall goal. But maybe it'd be m- more useful if they had the goal to study English every day. Maybe I'll study vocabulary for 10 minutes. Maybe I'll practice speaking every day, for example. And it sounds a little bit similar to that. Exactly. Yes, it is very similar. Yeah, that's also something that I truly believe in, like always focusing on systems rather than goals. And I think I'm fortunate in a way that when I was a little kid, my dad would always talk to me about creating new habits this way. Like my dad is extremely smart. He loves to read books. And uh, he also really likes to have conversations with his kids as if they're adults, both Mm -hmm. of my parents, actually, my mom and my dad, but my mom is more like a compassionate person, everything that's connected with emotions. And my dad is like, okay, so you want to move to a different city, you want to move to a different country, that's your goal. But what's the system? You know, how are you actually going to do it? And I think that's also something that really helped me understand that if I wanted to move to a different city, move to a different country, learn English, I can't just like walk around and tell people, oh, I want to learn English. That's it. No, Mm -hmm. you actually have to create this system and do something every day or every other day. But obviously it's better because when you create, when something becomes your system, it happens automatically. Like you do something every day because you want to. It's a part of your life. It's a part of your lifestyle. Um, what do you think, Sam? Do you agree with me here? Yeah, I think I think your environment is really important as well. And the environment that you live in and you, for example, if you want to eat healthier, for example, if you live in a house where there's lots of unhealthy foods, then it's going to be a lot more difficult to um create the habit of eating healthy 
So I found that with uh, lots of different things and especially with the, you know, the people I live with. So for example, at university, it's a lot harder to be healthy at university because, you know, you live maybe in halls or you live in a house with uh, lots of different people. And there's a lot of unhealthy habits going uh, around a university. So, well, maybe in the UK, I don't know what it's like in other countries, but especially the UK. But if you go somewhere else, or for example, if you live by yourself, you might have the advantage because you get to have more control over your environment environment, and you uh, get to, you're perhaps less persuaded by uh, temptations. Yeah, absolutely. You started talking about uh, like how to uh, break free from bad mm -hmm. habits and like what advice or maybe like your experience with it. For example, you mentioned, yeah, being in college and uh, having maybe bad um, habits when it comes to when it came to the food you were eating. So what helped you to overcome those things? Yeah, I'm I'm quite good at healthy eating and my dad is really jealous of me because of this because he he's generally quite healthy. He goes to the gym a lot as well, but he really struggles with eating unhealthy foods, especially like late in the evening. So he he'll get to 8 p.m. and he'll think, "Oh, I really want some food." And I just tell him, "Just don't eat anything. You've almost got it's almost bedtime. Just wait until you go to bed and just you can eat in the morning." But he he really struggles with that and one way i combat this is because i am quite similar to him in the sense that we both have a sugar um a sweet tooth sorry and we both really like sugary things and one way that i combat this and not and eat healthy quite consistently is when i go food shopping I just avoid the aisles with the bad things. And it maybe makes my life a little less enjoyable because I don't eat crisps or sweets or donuts uh, that often. But when I'm in the supermarket and I see sweets and crisps, I just keep on walking and do don't pretend it's there. So that's, that's, a, ha that's a, a habit that I've got into, which has definitely helped me with eating. Um, I don't know, you have to be, you have to make the habit harder. So you have to make, you have to, create more friction between you and doing that habit so for example i had the habit of i still do this quite often actually so I, i'm not as good as I'm, I'm saying i'm going to be with this one but i it's not a good habit in my opinion to wake up and go on your phone and spend the first 10 minutes of your day on your phone checking the news uh yeah on social media doing whatever that's me yeah, but it's so easy to do because you're tired, you know, it, it's it's right next to you. And one way to combat that is just to leave your phone in a different room when you go to sleep. When you go into your room, you just shut the door, your phone is downstairs. And that means if you want to, if you want to spend the first 10 minutes of your day on your phone, you have to wake up, you have to go downstairs, you have to pick up your phone, you have to go back to bed, and then you spend the next 10 minutes. That's a lot harder than just reaching over, grabbing it and spending the next 10 minutes on your phone. So I think trying to controlling your environment and adding friction uh, between you and the habit is probably the best advice I've heard. Yeah, no, that's actually a very, yeah, very good advice. Because um, I think as a person who spends a lot of time on their phone in the morning, I would say, Okay, but I can't really go to bed without my phone because I don't have a clock here in my room. So like, I don't know what time is it. But at the same time, I understand that it's an excuse. You know, if I need to see the time, I can just buy a clock, for example, or I can use my watch for that. So yeah, at the same time, I feel like it's important to realize that there are excuses that we often use to continue doing our bad habit. And, um, for example, yes, for me, it's definitely, I have this habit of just like, I wake up and I'm immediately on my phone and that makes me very anxious. It's not so much about spending a lot of my time on my phone in the morning. It's more how this affects me. And that's something that I, like, I'm really working on right now because I understand that I grab my phone, I start like scrolling through like new messages and emails and all of that. And it's just like, I'm overwhelmed. And that's why I feel anxious. And so that's why right now, every time I wake up, I'm like, okay, I'm awake. Now it's time to make my bed, time to brush my teeth, time to shower. And then while I'm making breakfast, I can check stuff on my phone. Um, yeah. And I think here, 
recently I learned that basically most habits follow this loop. So the first part is a cue and then your routine and then your reward. So the cue is like a trigger that leads to your good or bad habit. And for me, the trigger is I wake up, you know, I'm awake. It's time to see my phone. phone. Exactly. And I see my phone. Yes. And then obviously you have your routine, your habit, uh, being on your phone, and then you get your rewards. Even though I feel overwhelmed, but at the same time, I see all of this information. So I feel maybe a sense of relief. I feel all the, like I see all the messages from my family, my friends, and even like work stuff. And I'm like, okay, yes, like, you know, everything is okay. <laughs> everything is fine. But at the same time, still like knowing all of this information makes me quite overwhelmed. So I think once you break one of those like parts of the loop, it gets easier. And as you said, a great way to do that is creating friction. Absolutely. So I think I need to start putting my phone away. Oh, <laughs> that makes me feel so like anxious too, because I'm like, oh my God, I feel like I'm going to fail. But at the same time, I need to try. It's going to be very good for me long-term. Yeah, I use i have an apple watch so i just have that charging next to me so if i really do need to see the time i just you know touch that and it tells me the time but yeah maybe you can buy a you know a really cheap uh clock and that would work as well i have an apple watch too but mm. it's 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 dead almost all the time i don't know why i don't use it as much anymore but again if i really wanted to break free of this bad habit of being on my phone all the time you know i would i would put my phone in my living room i would start watch uh, i would start using my apple watch so before this year i really wanted to make a an effort to drink less alcohol because in british culture and society alcohol is pretty much everywhere and most people drink it in all occasions and for the average person they probably drink too much and one way i've i've this year i've drank the least amount of alcohol i have since i turned probably 16 and one of the reasons for that is because i learned more about the negative effects of it so i listened to a horrible podcast by andrew huberman on alcohol and it's horrible it's an excellent podcast but it's horrible because it gives you so many uh details on how bad alcohol is for your body and your mind so after i had seen the truth of that uh after i've seen the truth of how bad alcohol is for your body it's kind of there those thoughts are lingering with me every time i have the option to uh, have an alcoholic drink or not which is not great because i have to kind of sometimes uh, for example this weekend when i go to london it would be better if I am drinking because me and my friends will probably have a better time. And I don't want to be that one person to say, oh, I'm not drinking because that is kind of, I just don't want to do that. So then I will have to have a conversation with myself where I'm like, okay, it's just one weekend. It's fine. It's not going to do too much long-term damage, but because I found out more information about it, and this could work for a positive habit, for example, uh, eating healthy or going to the gym or not going on your phone in the morning, learning about the benefits or the negatives of something could be really useful. And, and then it's the other side, it's experiencing that. So after I went three months without drinking any alcohol, I had not just kind of heard the benefits. So for example, when you hear the benefits of, oh, for example, meditating is a great one. You meditate for the first time and you're like, well, I, you know, I still feel anxious. I still feel stressed. I didn't do anything. I was just thinking about, well, I'm going to have for dinner for 10 minutes. And you don't really see the benefits of meditation until you've done it for quite a while. And there is a big difference between knowing something or recognizing something and understanding it. So with me drinking alcohol, it didn't really um, settle in or it didn't really settle in my mind that I want to continue drinking less be- until I had experienced what it, what those benefits actually were. And once I, ben- once I experienced sleeping better, having more energy, for example, I was like, wow, this is actually great. And I, I have that desire uh, not to drink now. So learning about it and experiencing the benefits or negatives of something is, is a good way to, as well. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Educating yourself on something is extremely important. And I think that's also something that my dad did a lot when I was a little kid. Well, when I was a teenager, because, uh, for example, he would he would never tell me like, oh, drinking a lot is bad or like this is bad. That is bad. He would be like, you can do whatever you want to. But here's the information. And I think that's something that I really appreciated, like this kind of parenting when your parent just gives you this honest information on something without saying that's bad or don't do that. But because, I mean, like kids, teenagers, adults, like we're not stupid. We can understand. Yes, as you just said, like once you listen to that to that podcast, you were like, oh, that's horrible. Like, I actually don't want to do those things to my body. And um, I think it was exactly the same thing for me with uh, like becoming vegan. It's definitely like educating myself on becoming vegan because my dad is plant-based too. So again, it's something that my dad started. Um, When it comes to alcohol, it's very interesting for me because uh, I really like wine, but I like wine because I'm very nerdy about wine. (laughs) So I feel like that's the reason. I don't like wine because, oh, you know, I can just like drink and get tipsy or drunk. No, I like wine because it's scientific, because I can be (laughs) that like one nerd in the room who knows all the information about this grape. And I could be like, no, don't get this wine, get that wine. Or like, do you you taste the difference between this grape and that grape? And um I think that's something that uh, really influences my choices sometimes because, uh, yeah, a few months ago, I would say probably like six months ago, I found myself going to different wine bars four times a week or (laughs) a lot. And, you know, like you drink there and you get a bottle to take, you know, to take with you. And it's a lot of alcohol. But I think one thing that helped me stop doing that is the fact that I was spending a lot of money. So for me, it was, I understood that it's not that healthy for me, even though people say, oh, if you drink like a glass of wine a day, it's good for you. But actually not because I found research that says that you don't actually have to do it to be healthy. Uh, So I knew that, you know, I was kind of deceiving myself. But when I looked at my bank account, I was like, oh, no, Like, I don't actually want to spend this much money on wine. And alcohol can be quite expensive. So that's something that helped me stop doing that. When I realized how much money I was spending and that I could use all of this money and do something else. You know, invest for the future, save this money or buy something for my work, a new camera, for example. So that's something that really helped me stop doing that. Sure. I think people in Britain like to drink to get drunk. So very different from being nerdy about the different grapes and specific types of wine. But are there any, we've talked about some habits that maybe we should both break, maybe going on our phones in the morning. Are there any habits that you want to uh, form or start? Yeah, that's a great question. I think for me, I really want to form a better habit of going to the gym because uh, you mentioned uh, in the past, you would only go to the gym like twice a week. And that's my situation right now. Like I only have enough energy, I guess, but it's not, it's just like, I create a lot of excuses for myself, you know? And right now I only go to the gym twice a week. That's it. Because sometimes I'm just like, oh, I have so much work, you know, all of those excuses. Like I'm that type of person who creates a lot of excuses for themselves not to do something. Uh, So for me, I would really love to exercise at least five times a week, maybe not every day. I want to give myself this flexibility. But yeah, that's my goal right now. What about you? I think I want to start meditating frequently again, because when I lived in Madrid, I had a great habit of meditating every day. I was using Sam Harris's Waking Up app and that was really good. Oh, I love this app. Sam Harris. Oh amazing yeah but now i don't do it and i haven't done it for a while and i think it's a habit that i really relied on to kind of improve my mental health and kind of reduce my anxiety on a day-to-day basis so i would like to start doing that again it's it's just 
I guess the more I use my phone, the more difficult it is to kind of just sit there for a minimum of 10 minutes and just not have any uh, simula- uh, stimulation. So I would love to start doing that again. And I'd like to start writing a diary again. So I used to, I, on my old laptop, I have got a, a Word document, which is about three or four years of my life and uh, just of, of a general diary. And it used to be such a nice thing to kind of to do that, not every day, but you know, once a week minimum. And then go back and see what I was doing and how I was feeling before in the past. And sometimes I look at events that troubled me before in the past and I look at them from the from the present. I think, wow, that was so silly. I can't believe that took up so much of my <laughs> thoughts and emotions. So I'd like to do that again uh, because I haven't done that in a very long time. So it's just about, like you said, uh, forming that habit. Yes, I think I'm going to be a little copycat and say that (laughs) I would also really love to form this habit of journaling again, because I used to have this habit. I used to journal very consistently. And I also have a journal somewhere right here. And uh, yeah, it has like a lot of a lot of information, a lot of entries. And uh, I really like what you just said about like how when you open your old diary journal, and then you look at like what you wrote probably like a year ago, and what you were worried about a year ago. And now you're like, Oh, my God, it's it's fine. It's totally fine. I'm okay. Yeah, so I think that's definitely going to help me a lot. Uh, when it comes to just like processing my emotions, just documenting my life. So yeah, thank you for this idea. No worries. Well, hopefully you guys have learned something useful about forming and breaking habits from this episode and found it interesting. In the description, there will be a transcript available of this podcast episode. So if there are any words or phrases that you've heard that you don't quite understand or they sound new to you, then you can always find them there. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Sam, for this conversation. And thank you to all of you for listening to us today. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Bridging Borders. If you enjoyed the conversation, be sure to subscribe to the podcast for more useful insights. Stay connected by following us on social media. You can find us at bridging underscore borders underscore podcast. Until next time, keep exploring, keep learning and keep connecting.